Welcome to the Surf Strong Show. I'm your host, Greg Finch. I'd like to remind you to like, subscribe, and comment wherever you get your podcasts or at surfstrongfit.com slash podcast for all full episodes, notes, transcripts, and links that we talk about in every episode. Thanks for joining us. It really means a lot. Today, we welcome Scott Harrison. Scott is a photographer working out of Newcastle in Australia. And on today's episode, we talk about how he got into surf photography and oceanscape photography, leaving a corporate career and pursuing this dream, traveling for a year with his wife. We just had a really great time going into his art. Let's get to our episode with Scott Harrison. Yeah, so I'm in a, um, a little town called um, Newcastle in Australia. So yeah, on the east coast of Australia. So yeah, we're about two hours north of Sydney, um, which is probably the city that most people would know. Um, yeah, and I live in a little, um, I guess, a beachside suburb called Merriweather. So Merriweather Beach is the, the spot where I live. Nice. And how long have you been there? Um, so I grew up in Newcastle, um, in this like in this area. But then, yeah, when I was sort of in my 20s, I moved to Sydney for a real job, so to speak. So I used to work in the sales and marketing world. And so, yeah, I went and did the, the city life for about 10 years. And uh, yeah, then just got sick of got sick of the concrete buildings and needed to be back on the beach. So uh, where I grew up, I was literally like a street back from the beach. So like my whole childhood was basically spent on the sand and in the water. When I was away from it for too long, I just needed a needed a shift and wanted to come back. So yeah, ended up back here, which is amazing. All my family's here and yeah, because I grew up here. So um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's an amazing spot. It's one of those nice things too, when you, when you are able to be in a beautiful spot to be able to leave it, it's like that. Early, yeah. And that happened so much with, um, traveling as well. Like once I sort of got into my twenties and I started, like, all I wanted to do was travel and, you know, go and see places. And, um, so I spent a lot of time like overseas, I spent some time in the States, but I spent a lot of time in Europe and then even like in Southeast Asia. And when you're reading, you know, back then the lonely planet guides, and they're talking about all these like amazing beaches that you're going to and like you go there which is supposed to be the best beaches in the world and you're like i literally live on a beach that's way better <laughs> so we're super lucky in australia with the uh the coastline and everything that we have and it's exactly that like you kind of you go away and you realize wow there's not really that many places that, that match up to where i actually live so that's such the key of it i mean it sounds so simple but it really is about its perspective i think that's why mm. You know, as surfers, we inherently travel, you know, it's, it's something that, that, that we just do for part of this love that we have, but you yeah. really want to like, you, you want to be able to convey that to people that don't like I'll interact. Like this is a pretty small town where I am too. And it's like, mm. you'll talk with somebody and they'll be complaining about something and you can just hear in their tone. You're like, oh, you haven't left in a while. Like you yeah. really need to go see some other things to come back. Like that won't yep. bother you anymore at all. <laughs> A hundred percent. Yeah. So how long, yeah. how long have you, how long have you been, um, doing photography in general? Was it something that started really young in your life and then kind of pursued more as you went into it? Like how did that path into this art that you do start? Yeah. No, it's really interesting. Like it definitely wasn't a, um, early on thing at all. So, um, growing up, I was just all sport. Like I thought I was gonna be a professional soccer player growing up. That's all I did. Like every weekend, like all the time, like that was like my whole thing. Um, and yeah, it's funny, like it's cause I've chatted to a couple of people. I've got this weird recollection that now I kind of like look back on, um, and make sense of, but I, um, I didn't kind of know at the time, but I used to always, cause as I said, like I lived at the beach, I was a, like bodyboarding kid. That was like my thing when I was younger. Um, but I'd still always watch surf movies. So you'd have like VHS tapes of like, you know, Kelly Slater, black and white and sabotage and all those old school surf movies. And, um, I'd watch them on the TV and I'd have the remote. And then every time they'd do like an air or whatever, I'd pause. And I used to be fascinated. I'd sit there for hours in front of the TV and I'd be like pausing the video rather. And I didn't even know why. It was just something that kind of like fascinated my mind. And um, I thought it was just a fun thing to do. But like looking back on it, I guess later in life when I picked up photography, I feel like there was just something that I was kind of like, I just love capturing those like split second, like still moments in time that you can't see with your eye unless you freeze it. And um, yeah, it's fascinating to think back on that because I distinctly remember doing that like all of the time. And maybe that's just a bit of a weirdo, but it must have been my early uh, desire for photography. But yeah, I really, I mean, I always had a camera like through, as I said, through traveling, like um, I traveled a lot in my twenties, um, early thirties kind of thing. And I, so I always had a camera and I always loved the idea of 
capturing shots of places that we went and everything, but it was never really something that I thought was like a serious thing at all. Um, and it was probably when we moved, finally moved back to Newcastle. So yeah, I kind of got, you know, sick of living in the city, me and my wife, well, my wife now at the time, um, moved back to Newcastle and the first, like we moved back basically near like the same sort of area where I grew up. And so we're close to the beach. And, um, the first morning we woke up and we're finally back near the beach. There was this amazing sunrise, like bright pink sky and everything. And I just remember it coming through the window and we both kind of woke up and looked out the window. I'm like, Oh, we're back on the beach again. And like, just ran straight down. I took my camera down, took some photos of the sunrise and some waves. I can't even remember if the surf was good that day, but I just distinctly remember that. And I'm like, Oh, I'm back here now. I'm going to just start doing this every day. Like this, this has to be my life now. Like I can't, you know, not make use of the fact that we're in this amazing spot again. So I literally just started going down and just taking photos like every morning with once again, like no intention. Um, and yeah, I guess it was just all that combination of like being back near the beach, always had a love of waves, surfing, bodyboarding, whatever it may be. And, um, it all just started to, to blend together and, um, yeah, just became obsessed with it. Um, started learning everything I could about it and it just sort of, yeah, it's progressed through. Yeah. Has a, is a, is a majority of, uh, the, the shots that you take and obviously just some proximity when you're at home, do you mm -hmm. do a majority of your, um, shots are right within your geographic area? I'm sure you travel and I'm sure you do other yeah. things, but yeah, you find a, that the majority of that is there. To a degree. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was first shooting, it was literally just going to my same local beach every day. Cause I was just learning how to use a camera. So I was just kind of photographing the same thing coming home and like looking at the photos looking at the settings and like why did this one work why did this one work watch some youtube videos learn a bit more so it wasn't even so much about the location at that point it was just learning how to like take a good photo um and then since then yeah i mean where we are here we're sort of lucky in the sense of even in my vicinity there's lots of different breaks um so i can get variety within you know 15 minutes 20 minutes from my house um but also if you go even just an hour north or south of where I am. It's just like a whole coastline of surf breaks and different little inlets and different backdrops and, you know, different types of breaks. Um, so yeah, there's some spots that are like surfing waves. There's some spots I got really into like backwash kind of photography. So where like, you know, two waves come together and they sort of explode up in the air. Um, and there's a couple of spots about an hour from my house here where like there's that happens, which is incredible as well. And so I got a bit obsessed with that and started chasing that and, yeah, so we're super, super lucky. Um, you can travel anywhere up and down the east coast of Australia and find different spots, but um, majority would be here. And then, yeah, me and my wife have got really into traveling back and forth to Indonesia. So um, we go over to Bali a lot. And so I shoot over there a lot as well now. Um, we, how do you kind of um, split through for um, straight landscape and oceanscape? and surf specific individual, um, you know, people that you're connecting with and getting shots of them, like, are mm. they very distinct? Like today I'm really going to shoot just oceanscape and I'm going to just get the energy of the ocean. And today I'm going to be filming this break and getting shots of this particular athlete. Like, do you go into it that way? Or is it just kind of, let me see what yeah, today brings. It depends. It's a funny one. So. I think like anyone, when you first pick up a camera, you tend to the obvious first lessons that you find are shooting landscapes. That just seems to be sort of what's out there. And when you learn all of your basic photography, like rules and everything, it sort of all comes from landscape photography. Um, but I feel like I've probably taken that a lot into like my surf wave ocean photography. So I kind of tend to maybe like, I call it like surfscape. So basically I feel like I look at shooting waves and surfing almost with the mindset of a landscape photographer, but with the wave or the surfer as the subject. So a lot more wider scenes, looking for backdrops, looking for foregrounds, that kind of thing, rather than it being very much just zoomed in on the wave. Um, now, once again, there's times like there's, it depends where it is. Generally when I'm at home, I'm always looking for that more landscapey style of shot. Um, the way usually in my mind I'm thinking about it is more, I'm just thinking about the image being a print on a wall rather than maybe the cover of a magazine, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, if it was printed out bigger, you can kind of see all the detail and everything in the scene. Um, but yeah, then there's times when I go over to Indo and I work with some of the local guys over there, getting some shots for them, for their sponsors and stuff. 
And if the surf's really good there and sometimes like we're out on a boat and you're looking like straight into a barrel, then you're trying to get as much detail as you can like cropped in. So like at least you can see a few stickers and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it definitely depends on the yeah. on the time. But um majority of the time if I'm shooting for myself, I'm looking for something a little bit wider and thinking like how can I make this a print? So here's this this interesting question that always comes like from my surfer's mind, right? It always comes mm-hmm. to like I just went on I went on a retreat recently down to Mexico and there was a full time photographer and videographer shooting that also surfed of course. Like he was there as a yeah. job. And I asked him this que- the same question, which I'm going to ask you. Yep. When it's fiery, and yep. your your skill set is a photographer, yep. how do you balance that? How do you balance doing that and knowing, like, okay, I'm going to maybe get a few at the end, or maybe I won't get yep. any today. I need to really commit to this. Like, how do you balance that out? To be honest, yeah, it's a funny one, but to be honest, since I've picked up photography later, like my as a photographer, I'm still like a frothing grom. Like I'm checking surf line and checking forecast and all that sort of stuff in exactly the same way as a surf. Now, I guess to take that back, like I can't, I can't surf surf to save my life. Like I grew up as a bodyboarder um, and I did that a lot when I was younger, gotcha. but like, yeah, now I'm like basically wholly like a photographer and then, you know, maybe like jump in and go for a swim kind of thing. But I'm, um, but yeah, I have the same, yeah, the same froth levels and the same excitement when I'm like looking at forecasts and studying them for it to be, um, you know, the same way a surfer would want for the waves to be. But yeah, it's funny because I, cause I, I teach a bit of photography and um, I've met some surfers along the way that have like come to learn, like they want to learn how to use the camera for the same reasons you're saying. They're like, well, if I'm going on surf trips all the time, I may as well take a good few good photos when I'm there. And then they all end up the same way. If they're pure surfers, they're just like, well, if it's any good, I'm never going to be taking photos. I'm going to be surfing. And then the only time that I'd take photos is when the surf's not that great. And I'm kind of exactly the same i'm like if the surf's that good i definitely want to be capturing it so it kind of it's sort of yeah it would probably be more difficult if i was just had the same like intensity to want to surf you know what i mean and i was a really good surfer like it would probably be more difficult but for me i'm definitely the the photographer in that relationship it's interesting how um the idea of of coming to um photography as the craft later in life and now obviously you're a professional and coming to that there's something to be said about it being a little bit later and still having that excitement and that Mm. that sense of discovery and and expanding because i i've known a couple other professional photographers that not surf specific but Mm. you know they got to a very very high level and they still do it professionally but it's very much like this is my job like Mm. you know like I, they could still be learning, of course, but it's very much yep. like, you know, they it's, they've they done it for so long that it's hard to keep that excitement. Yep. So that's mm. probably something like, how old were you when you really started getting back and when you moved back, when you really started getting into photography? How, how, how long ago was that? Yeah, so it was really only like five or six years ago. So I was already like little, like mid 30s kind of thing, like 34, kind of 35, that kind of age. And um yeah, it, it, it's a really, it is a fascinating thing because it's similar to, so my wife was a school teacher and then around the same time as like I left a corporate job and basically what happened is around 2015, 2016, we went traveling for a year. We're just like, let's just leave our work. We're going to go backpack for a year around Southeast Asia and just kind of figure out life kind of thing. And um, we came back and I'm like, I'm going to be a photographer. And she's like, I'm going to be a Reiki healer and a meditation coach and that kind of thing because it's just some stuff she'd found along the way. And um, yeah, it is fascinating because now we're both at an age where you can probably approach it in a business sense with a lot more life skill and knowledge. You know what I mean? You're not starting out trying to start a business as an 18 year old, but it's with the like excitement and energy of like something that you do when you're younger kind of thing. It's almost like people do something they love until they get to a point where they're like, I've got to be sensible now and get a real job. And we kind of had real jobs and now we're being the nonsensible ones. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, it's, it's super interesting for sure. Yeah. But, and it's definitely helped. Like that's the thing with, I mean, there's so much stuff when you're doing photography as a business, like photography is one of those things that, yeah, there's a skill set to it, but it's becoming like, you've still got to have the eye, but I guess with equipment and everything, things are becoming easier and easier to get a sharp photo and that kind of stuff. So the, to be able to make a business out of it, there's a lot more elements to it than just being able to take a photo. Um, and I think that's, what's been interesting about coming to it after having experience in, you know, the real world and 
having a real job for so long and that kind of thing, you can bring a lot of those like life skills into it. And it's, that's probably why it's been able to kind of take off and progress a little bit quicker, maybe than it would have. Having that, that sales and marketing experience mm. and being able to apply that to something that you're really passionate about. That also mm. feels like having that aspect of your career as a positive component to it, like the, the choice to step away from it, but then like you develop this skill set, and now I'm applying it to something that I'm really passionate about that that's got to feel pretty rewarding. Definitely. It's amazing. I mean, that was the, the whole reason that I sort of got jaded on it. Like the corporate work was, I mean, you sort of like, I grew up in that era where like you have parents where all they think is just go to university and get a job, go to school, get a job. You know what I mean? It's like the whole, you know, like I didn't grow up in a social media world, that kind of thing. So the the things that people can do now, like, you know, podcasts where you can talk to someone on the other side of the world, I mean, like that sort of stuff didn't exist then. So I did that. I went to uni, got a degree, went and got a job. And, um, but yeah, the reason that I kind of got to the point was, I'm well, I'm kind of, I'm good at my job, but I'm just selling stuff for a company that doesn't care if I'm here or not really at the end of the day, you know what I mean? Like I enjoyed the job and I enjoyed my boss and everything, but I just, I know that the day I left and went and did something else that they just find someone to replace you. So you're not really doing anything that's kind of fulfilling, you know what I mean? You're just earning a living. And um, so that's why both of us like left what we were doing to try and do, you know, to try and create a business of something that we love. And, um, but yeah, without that a hundred percent, like that's, you know, especially that sales and marketing background and being in a position like when you're in, when you're in sales, like you just get used to hearing no, right? And that's one of the biggest things in business. You know what I mean? When you're trying to put your stuff out there, the biggest reason probably people wouldn't pursue like a passion as a career is because of the rejection that may happen early on when maybe people don't get it yet or you're trying to do something and you know what I mean? But I'd gone through that training for, you know, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. So that part of it doesn't phase me. So now I'm just like, I know if I just keep pushing forward and just be consistent and just keep reaching out and just keep, you know, emailing another 20 people that, you know, eventually someone's going to say yes, and then you can have work and then you're going to, you know, so yeah, def 100% without that, I don't think I could be doing yeah, what I'm doing now for sure. Yeah, that skill set is, is so priceless. Like th that mm. idea right there is something so universal that we repel against, which is this idea of rejection that we take mm. it, so we internalize it and make it so personal. And that's, yeah. that's what, what's so interesting about that is picking up the phone with the idea that I, I pause, I'm going to hear no more often than mm. I'm going to hear yes. And mm -hmm. to still be able to do that, like that, that never changes. Like the yeah. feeling of that, that there's something very evolved and protective for survival mm. of that idea of rejection, right? We want to be included. And totally. so to be able to have that and keep pushing forward, that's it. It's powerful. Mm. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, it's the same with like my wife's business. So she's like a kind of a, I guess like a women's wellness coach, Reiki healer, that kind of thing. Now, if she didn't have her career beforehand, then she wouldn't really have as much stuff to talk about. You know what I mean? It's like, it feels like you go on social media now and there's like, you know, 18 year old life coaches trying to sell the business. Model and it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. So like living a life before like helping people with it. Um, yeah, it's like it's like it's like uh, seeing a, a fifteen-year-old like virtuoso guitar player singing the mm. blues. You're kind of like, really? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But you're, tell me more about your year in Southeast Asia. I'd I'd love to hear more about that. Like the yeah, growth so, part um, of it. You know, certainly where you were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we just sort of. I mean, as I said, we'd always loved traveling, um, but we both had. Yeah, as I said, real jobs. So a lot of our traveling was, you know, two weeks here and there when you get holidays. Um, and we sort of, yeah, we got to the point. So we don't have, we don't have kids. Um, but we got to the point, my wife was like, oh, my friends are like having kids and therefore they're getting this like maternity leave. They're having a year off work and they're blah, blah, blah. And so we're like, why don't we just have our own version of that without kids and just have a year off and just go and backpack around Asia and, and see what happens. So that was the premise behind it. Um, as well, a few years before we'd met, um, we were traveling in Laos and we'd met this couple. So I think we were 30 and we met this couple that were 10 years older than us. And um, I remember they were traveling similar to, I guess, what we are now, like didn't have kids and they were traveling around and they wanted us to, we got along with them really well. And they said, oh, we're going here tomorrow. Do you want to come with us? And we're like, oh, we can't because we've got a pre-booked itinerary. Like we're only here for like 10 days. And so we have to go here and then we have to go home. And they were just on this extended journey. 
And I remember after that trip, we're on our way home and me and my wife looked at each other and were like, we want to be those guys one day. We want to be able to like go on a trip where we don't have to come home or we can just go, someone can go, oh, here's cool. Do you want to go here? And we can like, yep, let's do that. So that was literally the premise of that whole trip. So that year we, the first flight, we booked a flight to Bali and that was all we did. So we didn't plan any of it. And we're just like, we'll just stay in each spot as long as makes sense. Um, and it happened to be January at the time. So we got to Bali and it was rainy season. So like, I think the first five days, it just didn't stop raining. So we're like, that's cool. You know, let's just jump on a plane to Thailand. And so then we ended up in Thailand, um, landed in this little beach town and found this, um, like a dog rescue shelter, um, that was just nearby and they were looking for volunteers. Um, and so we're both obsessed with animals, obsessed with dogs. And so we're like, this is incredible. So we started just working at this dog rescue shelter on this tiny little beach in the south of Thailand, like the other, not the Phuket side where everyone goes, like the other side where there's no one around. So we'd have this daily commute where we'd walk 30 minutes down the beach, didn't see another person and then cut in and then that's where the shelter was. And then we'd work with these dogs all day and hang out, which is basically playing with dogs all day because you just, you know, rejuvenate him because they've, you know, had trauma and stuff. Um, yeah, we did that for, I don't know, like a month or so. Um, and then we're like, okay, where do we want to go next? And so we just started trekking around to a few different countries. But what was interesting, like, cause we went to my wife's family is from Malaysia. So we went and stayed with them in Malaysia for a little while. Um, and so there's all these sort of standard places you would go, but then what was fascinating because of this, this whole unplanned trip, we were, um, we were somewhere one day and I was looking up just YouTube videos of different ideas, different things to do. And I saw these people trekking to base camp at Everest. And um, so I started looking into it. I'm like, is this something like people can do? Or we just thought maybe we'll just go trekking in Nepal. Um, but then I started seeing these videos of these, you know, regular people that are like, no, you can get, you can get to base camp, like if you can get there. Um, and it so happened that one of my cousins had done some trekking before. So like I rang him up and said like, could we do this? And he's just like, yeah, it goes basically you just use the thing is like your feet won't get you there. Your mind will. So if you want to go and do it as a challenge and the worst thing you can do is just turn around and come back. Um, so yeah, that was a fascinating story. So literally we were in Malaysia. We didn't have any gear at all. We just had like singlets and board shorts and dogs to travel around, like, you know, to beach destinations. Um, we went and bought a pair of hiking boots and within a week later flew to Kathmandu um, went through the main town, bought a whole bunch of fake North face clothing and jackets and everything. Um, and we're trekking to Everest. And so then did Everest base camp, like 10 days after we, uh, we thought about it. And so that was like one of our, like, yeah, one of these amazing things that we, uh, that we did. Um, yeah. And then we went on to India as well. Um, I had a friend that I, um, lived with in London for a while. who was a really like world travel, like had been everywhere. And he always told me, he goes, you can't, say that you're a traveler until you've been to India, because it's just such an intense place to travel around and like work out and everything. So um, we thought well, we have to go to India. So we went there um, and yeah, it's just a, just a really cool year. That's actually in India. We're in the North of India um, and we happen to be there. It's the town where the Dalai Lama lives when he's at home and he happened to be in town the time we were there. So we went and saw him speak and we went to a, um, like a, you know, like a day with him. It was all in Tibet and you didn't understand it, but it was just more like being in the presence um, of him being there. And, um, yeah, that was the area where my wife found like Reiki, um, to learn. So she trained with a, a teacher over there and that kind of changed the path of, of her career. And yeah, it was fascinating. It was just like these little things just sort of all came together. And, um, yeah, I guess we got out of it exactly what we needed to. And so by the time we we're coming home, we're just like, yeah, we're not going back to our, our old jobs. Um, this is what we're going to do now moving forward. And yeah, I guess, but probably to touch on one of the other things like you were saying before about having a career beforehand, because a lot of people are always like, oh, how did you start being a photographer? Like, did you save up like a year's worth of money or did you do this, blah, blah, blah. And like both of our things were, no, we're just going to start doing it. But I guess in our mind, we we're always kind of like, but if it doesn't work out, we're still probably employable. You know what I mean? I thought like, oh, if I try the photography thing for a year or so, and it's just really not happening, then like... I still feel like I'm probably employable enough to go back and get a job because of my experience that I'd had beforehand. Um, so rather than financially, I guess just experience was the safety net to, to try something new, but yeah. So that was, yeah, that was pretty much the journey of Asia and yeah. What's, what's interesting about it too, for, um, for a lot of people, it's that I, of course, we could talk about fear, you know, over, mm. 
25 pod podcasts. Mm -hmm. But this idea of this is, is again, back to kind of like the comparison idea of like geography going outside something and seeing something different and being mm. able to really identify like, how much do I really actually need? I don't mean stuff mm. or financially. I just mean like, what is, what is it, what does it feel like to experience not having very much mm -hmm. comparative to my happiness? Like for a yep. lot of people, fear or a handful of other things, they really don't have that barometer. So it, mm. it keeps them into this place of either working this job that they hate or is just yep. kind of unfulfilling because the fear of that unknown, they don't have anything to compare it to. So yep. that like uh, Kevin Kelly is like, uh, he started Wired Magazine and he has uh -huh. this great little, he's written several books, but he has this great little book that basically is just about when he turned 68, he put together 68 um pieces of advice to like give to his kids and he, mm -hmm. and he did it every year after that for like a handful of years and he, and he put them all together in a book and in one of the one of the things like they're all great but one of them really steps out to me is this idea like when you're young for six months or a year go live in a tent go live in something that you have very very little so mm -hmm. you understand what that is so later in life if you want to take a chance on something the mm -hmm. worst case scenario, you know, is not that bad. And that's yep. so, again, it's powerful. It's that idea mm. of that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So we, um, yeah, so when we were working our, you know, real jobs, <laughs> calling them, um, like we were both earning, like, you know, pretty good money. You know what I mean? Like I was like kind of, I was managing a team of like, you know, 20 sales staff and my wife was like an assistant principal. So like when we were living that life, we were both earning like a pretty good income. Um, and we were younger as well. We we're living in Sydney, which is a city. So we were spending like people who like earned a decent income, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, and we kind of like the same thing, like get going out and getting the things and, you know, whatever, like not really thinking too much. Like, oh, I need a new laptop. I'm just going to go and buy without thinking about it and blah, blah, blah. So we did live that life for a little while. And yeah, we were probably fortunate. Um, like I didn't think either of us are like amazing with money and financial planning or anything, but we're fortunate enough that there became a point where we were earning this income, but then also we didn't realize that we'd racked up this credit card debt. And there was a point in time when like, we kind of were getting chased for like this debt. And we just both distinctly like, remember this moment where we were like calling on the phone, like trying to ring another bank to basically get a credit card to pay off this one. So it would give us more time, blah, blah. And it was just this, it's almost like this thing that like this moment in time that stuck with us. And so once we finally like cleared that up, it probably came in timing where we're like, you know, we want to change our careers and go and do this trip to Asia and everything. But we sort of just made a an agreement then that like we're never going to get ourselves into a situation where debt or anything like that is the reason that we have to do something. You know what I mean? It's like um, always like live within whatever your means are. Now, if your means get higher, that's fine. You can have more stuff. But like a, we never wanted a situation where we're like, if because we have this, that means we can't do something or you know, we can't leave this job or we can't try this thing or we can't go traveling. And so that's just been our motto now for like the last five or six years. And it's, um, yeah, it's interesting because it's not always easy. Like when you quit a really good job and you start your own business, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, eating two minute noodles and um, having to live, like change your lifestyle like dramatically for us. Um, we we're living this life of going out and eating at restaurants and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly we're like going, no, we really need to wind this back in. Um, probably the the year in Asia might have like helped that a little bit because we were just backpacking around Asia. So we'd probably just lived a year of like backpacking and living simply anyway, like you said, with, you know, literally a backpack, that's all we had. So possessions and that kind of stuff wasn't a thing. And so it was off the back of that, that we like moved into this new kind of lifestyle. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, it's definitely a mindset shift and um, yeah, it's not everyone. Yeah. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm just feel glad that we, we had that moment where we kind of had that realization because um yeah i know a lot of people now like once again as i said when i either teach people or just have co like coffee conversations with people and they're just like oh how do you do what you do and you just sort of talk to them about it and they're just like oh i wish i could but i've got this or just got a mortgage or i just bought this new sixty thousand dollar car they're gonna pay off or whatever you know what i mean and it's like yeah it's just it's a choice um I mean, the one thing sometimes is like, we don't have children. So I do get that. I understand that like, if you have kids, then you've got responsibility. So you've got to have some kind of 
you know, reliable income coming in, like to pay for that. So I'm definitely empathetic with that side of it. Um, but as far as the side of the coin of saying, hey, I'm choosing to buy something that's expensive to make myself feel better. And then I'm stuck in this situation then that now I'm going to complain about and I can't get out of like, that's something that I think, yeah, it'd be, you know, it'd be very freeing to people for people to realize that it's, um, it's much more enjoyable having choices and having the freedom to go and, you know, chase something that you love than having the actual thing that you're stuck paying for. <laughs> Would you benefit from 10 days of surf coaching? Learn surf specific movement, breath protocols, mobility exercises that are gonna help you surf strong for life? Then go to surfstrongfit.com slash challenge and get started. I really look forward to coaching you on the surf life journey that we're on. And now back to the show. Yeah, well that's, <laughs> that's absolutely true because really what it comes down to, you know, like I hear what you're saying, distinction with the kids, but that's mm. just another aspect within there of the responsibilities that you have and the choices yeah. that you're making. Like you oh, said, yeah. the thousand dollar car, the mm. boat, the, all of these things. Mm. Even when it comes down to it, like wealth is only, for, as far as I, I position myself for it, the idea of wealth and financial security is only for the choices and options that it provides you. That's mm. really it. And so that can Absolutely. always reset, you know, whatever those things are, making mm. a choice to have that car. Okay, well, it repositions some of these things to mm. where your options and choices are going to be affected by that. And yeah. that's what a lot of people, I think, if you look, they don't really see that as the whole, like an arc, mm. right? They see it yeah. as individual choices. And then you're mm. right. They get into mm. this position where like, well, I, I, I perceive that I don't have any choice because I have all of this debt. Well, yeah. you can choose to change that as you go forward totally. and yeah. not keep making the same choice. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And then it's fascinating because then like, because of our choices, we can do things like, which we do often is like pick up and go and hang out in Bali for a month. Um, and then suddenly you get all the messages of like, oh, you're so lucky. Like you're so lucky you get to do this. But it's kind of like, no, it's a choice. <laughs> Well, you don't, and they don't see what it takes to do that, right? They totally, only yeah. see the, the, like, like you talked about, like not growing up with social media, same thing for me too. That was never part of this. And, and it, mm. that's just, it's just a different aspect of getting little snippets into other people's best foot forward lives, right? You mm. see these things and you're like, oh, I wish I could do that. But we, you, none of us really have an understanding what it takes to make that happen. You know, no. like, so for yourself, you're, you're a month in, in Indo in Bali. But to make that happen, mm. two minute noodles, not mm. getting this, like choosing this kind of lifestyle to be able to have that flexibility to do that. And totally. that's, you know, and it is, like you said, it's a choice, but it's a powerful one that is something that you can, that just gives in so many intangible ways. Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, it's really, it is a fascinating one because it's um, like, there's so much personal work that you've got to do as well because if i could tell you the amount of times in the last five years that like both me and my wife have just gone like this is ridiculous let's just go get a job because things go like when you've got a business it just goes up and down you know what i mean and it's like to be able to push through those moments and the like the self-doubt that comes in the you know this it's something that you really want to do and it looks all well and good when you're you know sending pictures to your mates when you're in indo but the times when you're like in your home office and you don't have any clients and you're sitting there going how am i going to pay rent next week like they're the times that you've got to be able to get through in order to push through and um yeah and we've pushed through like a lot of those like don't get me wrong like but i mean it's never it's never um secure you know what i mean it's not a fortnightly paycheck that someone else is giving you so um there's definitely a lot of work you've got to do on that mindset in order to be able to handle it but um i think that's just always been something for me that um i've been kind of fascinated with anyway i think it's probably why i liked even just sales as a job because it was monthly targets and it was, you were always kind of, you were never, there was never like a security kind of thing. And I think it's just more exciting. It's, um, you know, you definitely have your down days with it, but, um, the idea of it just not being regular, not being the same thing every day, like not going to sit at a desk every day and just get your fortnightly pay and, and turn on. Like, I just don't think I could handle it. So I think the, uh, the unpredictable nature of it is, um, like what attracts me to, <laughs> 
to doing it, even though it's, uh, there's, there's plenty of days when you wish you had like, you know, a bit more security, but, um, yeah, I think that's once again, probably why I like photographing it's the ocean as well, because of the, it's that I've always kind of, when I've sort of thought about it, it's the unpredictability of it. Like when you go on to shoot waves, it's, you can't predict it. It's like, even as a landscape photographer, you, you can't judge the weather, but if you're going to go and take a photograph of a mountain, it's not going to move. So you can just set up, set up your tripod and wait there for hours until the perfect moment and then take a shot. Whereas when you go shooting the ocean, you're completely at its mercy of what it wants to do at any point in time. And you just, you have to be there and be ready for like split second moments. And, um, that's where you can get these amazing moments in time that no one gets to see. And that's what's so fascinating about it. But I think it's that unpredictability that, you know, keeps drawing me back to it for sure. So much of that is like such a great analogy there to um, being on the other side of the lens as, as the surfer. Like there's so much of that, like what you just said there is why surfing is so powerful for me in my life. It's that idea. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it is so unpredictable. You can anticipate as best you can and information mm -hmm. that you can get to make an educated guess. But when it, when all is said and done, you have got to be there and you've got to be completely present because if mm. you're not, it's gone. And, yep. and that idea of that, there's something so powerful about that, which just brings me back to, and it's probably very similar to you. Like mm. I need to be right here and not be thinking about this other thing that I have to take care of because in a split mm. second, I'm going to miss that shot. So I have yep. to be right here. And that idea of presence, right? That's what, it's really what it's we're all presence. seeking all the time. We just, yeah lose it <laughs> so yeah. often yeah yeah definitely no it's amazing and i think it's just like the the present thing like a hundred percent and also just the the photography thing that's been amazing as well and once again potentially something because it's been later on rather than early so i've had a bit more worldly experiences i've just been fascinated how it teaches you like there's a famous photography quote that says like photography teaches you how to see but what that essentially means for me is like just the way that you look at things, the way you notice things more. So even when I go traveling now and visit a new place, I feel like I'm observing it with such a different like mindset. I'm like looking at it in different ways. And um, it's funny because there's sometimes people will be like, you know, cause everyone's got a phone and a camera now. And there's this thing that like, you know, when people are traveling, it's like no one's experiencing the moment. They're all just taking photos like of the moment. And that's probably true to some degree, maybe with phones, but on the other side of that coin, I feel like also maybe like I'm now observing moments in more detail and noticing finer things and different things because I'm kind of, even when I don't have a camera, I'm looking at them through a, you know, a viewfinder in my mind kind of. So I'm, there's, I feel like sometimes like as a photographer now, like I notice things more and maybe appreciate things um, in nature like more because I'm so used to looking for that specific detail to capture with the camera. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to, to, to be able to break it down that way, because I guess it goes back to that idea of presence, like slowing mm. down, like slowing mm. down to be able to see that, whether it's the composition of that shot, mm. or just, you know, with a camera, or without just the ability to slow down your mind and your reflexes just to see that. And that's, yeah. it's such a trick, right? It, mm. it's, it's so interesting. We had this, this is kind of a side view of the same thing. Like, my wife and I were down in like a, a town just south of here and, and we were went out to dinner and we were driving back and between that town and, and our town is, is pretty wide open space. And it's a it's a highway, but it's um, surrounded by open space. And so we were driving, you know, just normal speed, but it was nobody around dark. And like she started to say, do you see that deer? And then there was like three of them, like right on the road. And yeah. that time so just pulled out to where it felt like it was like five seconds of that. And it was a, just a split second to be able yep. to like hit the brakes and get around that outside deer. And it, like it passed within like six inches of our car. Yep. And it's just so interesting how like you have that, there's in there like that skill mm. to be able time is yep. elastic it, it mm. when it's necessary survival wise it does that and it got me thinking after i calmed down and all the adrenaline got out of my <laughs> system like the next day i was thinking like 
where's the medium of that? Like, where's that mm. happy place to be able to stop and be more present without it yeah. being feeling like a life-threatening situation? And it's, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's a skill. And it's like what Definitely. you're describing. Like, yeah. how do you see these things more? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and I think it's um, like, yeah, I mean, just the way the world is now with everything, like everything's short attention span. And I think just the... So like basically like anything you do, right? Like if you, if you want to meditate, for example, like you need to meditate every day to then like for the practice to come in, you can't just go and do it one day and go like I'm sorted. And so it's like the practice and repetition <laughs> of something. And so it's the same with like, so when I go and shoot the ocean, that means that for at least an hour or two hours or whatever, like every morning or the, you know, most mornings when I go out, I'm sitting there in a moment like present enough, waiting for something to happen, being patient enough for something to happen. Like when I go and shoot backwash, for example, like you could be out there for two hours and literally one time it could collide and that'd be the photo that then you have forever. So it's amazing. But you've been sitting there waiting for that for like two hours and it's like that ability to be able to focus and concentrate on one thing. Um, it's lucky that it happens to be something that I love doing, but I think just as a as a practice, it's really, really beneficial like in the modern world where everything else is just like next thing next thing next thing to be able to have something that trains you to be able to sit still for that long so it's a it's a muscle it's a muscle mm. that you have to train for sure yeah. because it certainly is not um all of the systems behind technology and you know social media and all of these things not even to go in what's good what's bad the mm. mechanisms behind it are we need your attention to speed up and get through as many of these things as mm. possible to keep yeah. you here. I mean, that's just a yeah. very oversimplified mechanism of it. Mm. And to jump totally. off that train and mm. have the discipline to do exactly what you're saying, mm. that's, it, 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 it's something, this is like the old curmudgeon in me coming out. Like I want kids these days, you know, like <laughs> I see it in my daughter, like, yep. you, you know, we need you to, I need you to do something that isn't, fast constantly mm. i want yeah. you to have that skill you know yeah yeah but i'm in a phone as much as anybody like the rest of the time because i basically run my business off it like every every business inquiry and everything i get is through social media so like i'm definitely not preaching like not phone stuff but i think it's just you just need intentional times like if i go to the gym i don't take my phone with me because well that's an hour where i won't be looking at it whereas you go there and you see everyone else between sets and reps everyone's like just like checking their phone constantly so i think it just needs to be a you need to set intentional times to say i'm doing something else now for an hour or two hours because um yeah the rest of the time i'm as bad as everyone else <laughs> but you're right it, that that intention it's awareness it, it's mm. just to, to develop the skill to say okay this is the time that i'm not gonna do that yeah. part so I'd love to hear, like, I know some of the things you're doing now is um, working with, you even mentioned it earlier, some some people either on the newer side of photography or mm -hmm. maybe don't have any skill set at all. And they're coming in and, and you're helping, you know, give them some of the fundamentals of, of photography. Mm. Like, talk about that. Like, talk about how you develop that. Talk about how that works. I'd love to hear more about it. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's one thing that I've been always fascinated with. Like when I, when I picked up a camera, um, for whatever reason, I really wanted to know like how it worked. So I kind of went and, you know, I haven't had like photography lessons before, but I mean, every, you can find everything on YouTube. So I was just watching video after video, but I was still, I was really fascinated about understanding, you know, like aperture and shutter speed and ISO and how all these things work together and like why the camera works. And as I said, like going out in the early days and just, taking photos and then coming home. And then if one of them looked good, then going into the settings and saying like, why did this one work? Like what settings was this one? And then going out and trying that again. So it's just always something that when I came into it, I was really, I was really into. Um, so I learned like how to use a camera like really well. And it was kind of like, I guess I sort of got to the point where I'm like, I want this to be like second nature. Cause if I can just basically operate the camera on autopilot, then back to the other point, I can be way more present and ready to capture images in the moment. So I don't need to think about it. Like if there's a wave breaking down here, but then suddenly something happens over here, I don't want to be turning around and then spending the next few minutes trying to work out the camera settings. I need that to be as automatic as possible sort of thing. So um, yeah, it was just something I was always fascinated with. Um, so therefore I kind of learn a lot. Um, 
and yeah, I guess I've been, I mean, maybe it's through work before. I mean, both my parents were school teachers. My wife was a school teacher before she was a regular. So I've been around teachers a lot. Um, and just through conversations I'd had with people, I'd just have been people had said, oh, I really like the way you explain this or it makes sense when you do that. So I just felt like maybe there was a, a knack there for teaching in a way. Um, and surf photography in particular, because I guess all of the skills I kind of learned were probably more from landscape videos and stuff. There wasn't a lot of education around in, in surf photography in particular. There's a lot of amazing surf photographers, but there's like really probably only a couple of courses out there where specifically people are teaching you like how to take photos of the ocean or how to take surf photos. So um, I guess it was a combination of like something that I was passionate about, something where I saw a little bit of a gap. Um, ultimately, I want to continue to make a, a career as much around ocean photography as possible. Like, so I'm a full time photographer. So, you know, if you call it like Monday to Friday, I do a lot of work with like, like branding photography. I work with a lot of Pilates studios, yoga studios, like businesses like that doing their website photography, like in addition to my ocean stuff, um, as far as making a living, but the more and more it can push towards all being ocean related, um, the better. So that's why I kind of thought, well, I'll move into the teaching aspect. Um, so yeah, I started just doing one-to-one -one lessons with people locally. Um, and yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of beginners. Um, probably one of the things I found was that a lot of people when they first get a camera think they need to shift to full manual like too quickly to be, it's almost like, oh, I've got a camera now, the sooner I can get onto like all of the manual settings, then suddenly I'm like a, a pro photographer. And cameras are so good these days that you almost don't really need to. Like I kind of, I shoot like that now at this point just because I've like shot for so long, but it's like, you know, even like a couple of the auto settings on cameras these days are so good that they pretty much control the basics of exposure, which is what you really want. And so I became really passionate about seeing people almost felt like they're focusing on the wrong thing. It's like, I want to shoot in manual, but then when they take a photo, the, there was no thought about composition. There was no thought about any of the like artistic elements that like make a good photo. So I kind of made it my thing to be like, look, I'll get you past this bit. But at the end of the day, even if you're shooting on auto mode, composition um, and all that sort of stuff is an understanding light is way more important to a great image than the manual settings that you shot it on at the end of the day. Like essentially, as long as it's sharp and it's correctly exposed, then that's all that really matters as far as the, the technical stuff goes. And then after that, it becomes artistic. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of share that because that was just something that I don't know where it came from with me, but it was just something that always seemed to be the feedback I was getting in my photos was like, oh, I really like how you you know, use the light in this or understand this part of it. So I was like, okay, well, if there's something there, then this is something I can, I can share. So yeah, that's where it sort of began. Um, and then just in recent times, um, through my work, I got into video work and I work as a photographer. Um, and I started making some online course stuff for my wife's business. Um, and then one day I thought, well, why don't I just make my own and like, just share this. So, um, yeah, I got a camera and sat down and yeah, taught it all to a camera. So that way now it can be, yeah, in online course form. So, um, yeah, people all over the world can, can buy it and access it. And yeah, as I said, there's just not much out there specifically in the surf photography world for that. So it just, it felt like there was a, there was a space for it. Isn't that an interesting, I mean, it goes back to what we talked about earlier is like the fact that you're on the East coast of Australia, I'm on the West coast of California, and we're having this conversation in real time. Like mm. the ability to be able to um, educate and help support something you're passionate about with somebody like on the other side of the world, it's just like, mm. it, it, again, if you stop for a second, it really kind of blows your mind, but like it what really a wonderful does. space and time that we're in to be able to do that. And of course mm. the flip side of that is that, um, to get in front of them and to mm. get their attention in this very, very fast world that we live in mm. is something that you have to be very diligent and consistent about because yep. we are, we're mm. inundated constantly. And so mm. to be able to keep their attention and, and really connect with them, yep. that's, um, well, it's a full-time job. It's what we yeah. both do in different worlds in a full-time yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. But yeah, it's interesting because the one thing with, um, yeah, it, it's, it really is like, a mindset thing in both those sides of things. So in order to reach people in the first place, like you said, you have to be consistent in order to be consistent as a photographer in a social media world, you just have to be like, not you just have to like, not judge too much. You're not, not judge and not compared. You know what I mean? Like you can't put out enough content 
if you're constantly overthinking it. So I've always just taken the approach of I'm just going to continue to try and get better and just put out stuff that I like and just share it. Um, but also it's the understanding that like with the teaching thing, for example, right? Like when you first go into something like that, like anything, any of this new world stuff, like, and I don't come from a background of like my family were, like, as I said, they were teachers. So they weren't starting their own business. They weren't doing any of these things. So there's so much imposter syndrome that comes into everything that you do when you're trying to start something new. Um, like by far, am I not even remotely close to being like one of the best ocean photographers out there, right? So then you can like, well, who am I to teach something? But then you just come to the realization, well, you've just got to know enough that would be helpful to someone starting out and be able to deliver that in a way and to be able to offer it in the first place. Like I wish everyone had a course, right? Like I'd be stoked. Like if every, if every surf photographer in the world that I loved had an online course, I'd buy them all because I think there's always something to learn from everyone. So I just took the approach of like, well, this is something that I would have loved five years ago when I was starting out. It's definitely helpful because it's literally everything that I learned the hard way and searched the internet for and went and took photos and studied them for. So I know it's something that works because at one point I didn't know how to use a camera and now I'm here. So if I can just literally share all of that, then it's got to help someone that's starting out. So it's like just overcoming that thing where, you know, you don't have to be the best in the world to be able to share it. You've just got to have something to share that could be helpful to someone and then be willing to, I guess, yeah, put yourself out there and share it. And um, yeah, like you said, it's been amazing. Like now, yeah, I have people everywhere, like all over the world, like, you know, buying like a course to like learn photography and, you know, writing me messages going, oh, thanks so much. I learned this thing and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And it's something that, yeah, like I said, growing up in the world that we grew up in, like it wasn't even fathomable. That was a thing. Like, you know, <laughs> Like the, the, the fact that like we, we, we run our businesses a majority of time on this little tiny thing that is in our pocket. I mean, it sounds so corny. Like it dates us to say it that way, but it's know, not true. If you true. stop, like yeah. it blows your mind. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's to keep that, um, to keep the awe about that, you know, to, to, mm. again, to be able to be present and to be able to utilize these technologies without them overwhelming or distracting you from the other aspects of life that are available there for you. It's like balance, yeah. like anything else. It's awareness, totally. it's presence, it's utilizing these things in, 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 in a healthy way. Mm. That's, I guess that's life. <laughs> I feel very fortunate too. Like it's, I feel like that we're at a, an age, like being like, you know, being 40, like at an age where your childhood was completely not run by social media, like I wasn't using the, the internet until I was at university, right? So my whole school, like growing up, childhood, all of that time was like, you went to school, you went home, you didn't know what was going on with anyone else. If you wanted to go and catch up with someone to go to the beach, you rang them on a landline phone and you went and met up with them. Like it was just, it was, that was amazing, right? And then, but then we've been able to live enough of our adult life where we've been able to pick up the benefits of the technology. You know, for example, like my parents are kind of, they're of old generation, so they struggle with a lot of the technology. And if you're a young person, like my nieces and nephews, they're literally just growing up being bombarded with it all. I feel like in the formative years of my life, I didn't have to deal with social media, which I then think that now as an adult, maybe helps you approach it in a more calculated way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I think in that, w w we have the same kind of arc, that idea mm. of not having to deal with that when I was a child. Mm. And it's not like, well, you can't have this. It just, it just didn't exist. Mm. So you ha I have these memories of like going and being gone in summer from literally the after breakfast to all the way till night. Mm. And it's totally. so interesting. My wife and I have this conversation about our daughter. Like, we want to keep her safe. Of course, is what it is. It's this overriding of thing, of course. Mm. And then you're like, so like, she has a phone where we can see where she is. But it's the idea of not hovering over every aspect of her life. Like, mm. our only job is to get her ready not to need us. I mean, that hurts. <laughs> it pulls your heart out. <laughs> no, right. that way. But it's absolutely <laughs> true. Like, you need to be able to live your life without yeah. us. And yep. hopefully you'll include us in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about my daughter being a dog. She'll always need us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All immediate. It's all yeah. right there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Scott, thank you so much for joining us on the Surf Strong Show. It's been really no awesome. Worries. It's really great to get to know you a little bit more and all the things it's that you're doing. And, and we'll have links up for all your online courses and, and where, where for people to find you. And, yeah, just thanks for taking the time and being on, on the show with us. No worries. Yeah, I really enjoyed the chat. Yeah, it was super fun. Yeah. I'd like to remind you to like, subscribe, and comment wherever you get your podcasts or at surfstrongfit.com slash podcast for all full episodes, notes, transcripts, and links that we talk about in every episode. Thanks for joining us. It really means a lot.